So hi, this is Michelle, and this is the next episode of Not A Standard. Today we have a special guest on this podcast. His name is Nick. You may know him as the Flying Hawaiian on Instagram. He's a former Army Ranger in the Special Operations community that deployed six times, earning both a Purple Heart and Bronze Star with Valor in 10 years. He's also currently a junior at Harvard College, studying neuroscience to advocate for non-standard forms of therapy. While doing all this, he's attempting to be the first actively enrolled student in the history of Harvard to summit the tallest mountain on every continent to bring attention to student mental health and encourage veterans to pursue education after their military service. Like, so amazing. Um, so, so with that being said, I'd love to welcome Nick to the podcast. And if you're okay with it, I'd just like to get started. Yeah, let's do it. Let's hop in it. Okay, so if you can, can you tell us a little bit about the first part of your story? You know, an army person, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I grew up in Hawaii, uh, Hilo, Hawaii, the super small town on the eastern side of the island. And I grew up in like a pretty patriotic household. Not in like this crazy, like, super wild patriotism, but just like the classic patriotism of like respect police officers, first responders, military, and all that stuff. Um, and I remember watching the towers fall when I was in like the fourth grade or third grade and I was like I, I remember like waking up and like oh dude why is mom and dad not making me breakfast like why are we not getting ready for school kind of thing and my mom was crying and my dad was consoling her and I was like what is going on and we were watching the planes of the towers um, it was one of those interesting things that like I didn't really realize or I didn't know how that would impact me later on in life Right, and it's this is one of those like because I watched Towers Falls, like I must take up the crusade of justice and go fight the war or anything like that. It just kind of like dropped a little seed in my life. And then when I was ten, I moved from Hawaii to West Covina, right outside the Los Angeles area. Um, and you know, I, I kind of make the joke that uh, I didn't really go into the Asian stuff of like being super academic. I just went full like surfer, skater, like snowboarder kind of route. And through that, I didn't exactly excel in academia, which is comical because I'm at Harvard studying neuroscience. Um, and I, yeah, dude, it's weird. Um, and I, I got I got more into sports and athletics and more into like social life. And through that, it just kind of I, I noticed I had this like craving for adventure and this idea mm -hmm. of being out there. I really enjoyed being in a team. And you know, this is in 2006 to 2010. The war was still very much going on. So all of these different contributing factors from my life kind of kept pointing me towards this direction. And when it came time to graduate, it just kind of seemed like the right place to go. Um, and I, I would also be lying if I didn't say my recruiter didn't tell me some badass stories. And I was just like, whoa, dude, that sounds super cool. So it was, it was really interesting converging tide of a bunch of different things in my life that kind of pushed me on this course to join the military. Um, and I had a hell of a ride. Yeah, I can imagine. Like, So I'm going to ask about that because I feel like we all have preconceived notions of what it means to be in the Army. Like, As somebody who has lived that life, like, what was it really like and what was your day-to-day -day routine? <laughs> um, it, it varies by stage. I, it, for me, I was just joking around. I was 150 pounds, bald and scared and cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I remember um, because I went through, I joined in the infantry. And I didn't have what they call an 18 x-ray and option 40. I wasn't guaranteed a spot to go to special operations. I was just guaranteed a shot at the infantry. And then if I do well, potentially airborne school and things past that. Mm -hmm. um, and growing up in Hawaii and Los Angeles, I think the cold, and like, this is like snowboarding in Los Angeles. Like yeah. I'd go to like Mount High and Big Bear and things like that. It still barely ever got cold. And I remember I got put into Fort Benning, Georgia in January and they shaved my head, I was skinny, I was terrified, I was bald, I was like, oh my god, what's going on? And I was just terribly cold. I just remember being cold, a lot of cold. And it was my first time just being around a bunch of people from all over the world um, and being exposed to them at this level. And I remember I was sitting down outside, just like shivering, just like, burr, small Asian kid mm -hmm. cold. And I looked at this dude, he's walking around in t-shirt and shorts, and I have like as much cold weather gear as I could, as it would allow me. And I was like, dude, are you not cold? And he goes, I'm from freaking Minnesota, bud. If there ain't snow on the ground, it ain't cold, eh? And I was like, what is this? Like, who are you? What is this? What is this accent? Um, and that was just, that was like well, pretty much how to summarize my basic training experience was a lot of, a lot of just w learning a bunch of different social interactions. Um, it was this, and then with it being the infantry, that, that adds a little bit different flair than the standard uh, army experience. Um, mainly be due to, especially back then, a lot of our drill instructors and things like that were guys who were in the invasion of Iraq, were in the invasion of Afghanistan. They came off an active deployment cycle to come be drill sergeants and they're going back to war after this. So a lot of them 
very much had friends uh, that were still fighting in, in these active theaters. So when they when they worked with us and they were training us and teaching these things, they were very serious about it. And it was very much like, hey, you may leave this boot camp and go directly to Afghanistan or Iraq and go fight with some of my friends. So we want to make sure you guys are hard. And wow. because of that, it, it formulated or, or created a lot more of a, an aggressive um, style of boot camp than, than people may experience in the later years of the war or even nowadays, just because the climate's change and it's not as aggressive and, and it's not as much an active war. A good chunk of my military career in the beginning until I went through what's called ranger school. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then once I got back from ranger school, it began to change up. Um, and that's what's considered a leadership course within the military. And when I came back from ranger school, I was able to hold a leadership position and that changed the tempo. And I would say it pushed me into the next phase of my military career. Um, and during, from the time of basic training in ranger school, I deployed to Afghanistan. I was attached to 5th Special Forces Group as just, again, I was cold, I was bald, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, was, that was pretty much the theme up until I got back from ranger school, just being cold, bald, and scared. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it always makes me laugh. And coming back from ranger school kicks off the next chunk of my career, uh, a lot more of a leadership position, a lot of maturing there. And I was 20 years old, cocky. Uh, I thought I was I thought I was hot shit and made a ton of leadership mistakes did a lot of things wrong and I was very fortunate that I had a lot of good mentors and leaders that looked out for me and kind of were, were my bumpers I was just bouncing from bumper to bumper and they're like hey man you're doing this wrong hey man you're doing this wrong and we're always able to kind of keep me going right down the middle and where I needed to go yeah that's um, awesome yeah no I appreciate that um, so, go ahead yeah keep going I was gonna ask oh. you when you okay keep going <laughs> Oh, no, 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 go ahead, hit me, hit me, hit me. I was going to ask you, like, when you went on these tours, like, how hard was it? Um, they, they varied. So when I was with the convention military, I was in the 82nd Airborne. Um, that was nine months long, and that one was, I would say, the hardest living. Uh, mm -hmm. I, was, I was attached to uh, 5th Special Forces Group, and we were doing what's called uh, Village Stability Operations. And that was 2011, 2012, and the goal back then was to put us outside of a village and stabilize the region. And what that would look like is we'd get the local militias or local fighters in the area, train them, put them to some kind of boot camp, mm -hmm. and turn them into official Afghan National Army. And then we would go on patrols with them and, and do stuff like that in the area. What made that hard was they just we just drove a six hour convoy out of Meza Sharif, uh, northern Afghanistan. Uh, we just went further north to one of the borders, and they just dropped us off, just four gun trucks. And they're like, all right, boys, go get them. <laughs> And we're just like, dude, I just remember being, like, again, just cold, cold, yeah. young, bald, scared, hungry. Be like, yo, what, dude? Like, where's our camp? And they're like, dude, you're in it. And it was literally just an open field outside of a village. And we had four gun trucks. And we just put, like, uh, caution tape around. And they're like, right. all right, boys, tomorrow we're going to start building. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what is going on, man? Like, I've never swung a hammer in my life. And I was like, what is happening? Um, in that, that deployment, we hand-built our entire camp. Um, Doug dug every position, built every tower, and it was pretty much nine months of no running water. The only electricity we had, we came out of generators, and those generators had to go towards our command shed to, to power the radios and the computers and things like that. So the rest of us, it was pretty much nine months of no running water, no electricity, hand washing clothes, showering every other month, stuff like that. Well, <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I would like that. That would be hard. No showering. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, I, yeah, we um, we didn't shower for like the first two and a half months, and they dropped us off in June, late June, early July, super hot, and I remember the first shower I had was at a Swedish compound in uh, this town called Saripol, and God bless the Swedes, man, they were like, you guys are grimy, but like, you don't use our showers. <laughs> like and you stink. Like, <laughs> terrible, Get in the shower. <laughs> yeah, like just sprays down with a hose kind of thing. Um and there was just, I remember we got out of the showers, our whole team did, and there was just like a layer of mud on the floor uh, in the showers. And we're just like, we are so sorry. <laughs> like, can we help yeah. clean it up? Um, but yeah, so those those were a lot different than the later on, later on ones with special mm -hmm. operations. Yeah, what do you think would be like the hardest part from one of your tours that you've had to deal with? Um, that's interesting, right? Because you, you'd think it... It, I always, I always kind of like ponder on these questions. Not like I'm, I'm not like a deep, phys, like deep stoic thinker or something crazy like that. Like I just sit here and like ponder. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but sometimes 
I kind of when I when I think about these things or when I, when I try to contextualize in my own life, like I get I get lost in the idea of like I feel that it should be harder, like the combat should be like in, ideally I'm like was the combat the hardest part and really it wasn't. Um, in all honesty, a lot of the times the combat was like fun. It, I, was, I got to do wild stuff with my best friends and like even even losing guys. Um, you know, we lost a few friends out there. Even we lost one of our canines. Like that's always hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in the in those moments, those may have been the hardest parts. But looking back at it through the perspective that I have now, I think the hardest part for me through all my deployments and all the things we did over there was like recognize from this current perspective is being able to recognize and see that I was losing a lot of empathy and a lot of humanity and. Looking back at it, I stopped seeing, you know, enemy combatants as people. Mm. Um, I, I stopped recognizing them as humans. They were just dudes that I could, you know, that we, we would go to war with, and, and that's all it was. Um, so it's almost like a, a two-part. In, in the time of, like, being in it, in the action, mm. doing the fighting, it was very much, I would say, losing, losing the friends, lo- losing people that we cared about. Um, but now looking back at it, and don't get me wrong, it's not like it that got easier or anything like that, but looking back at it, it was, it was realize, realizing the empathy lost, um, just becoming numb. I would say it was, it was like the more, one of the harder things of it all. Yeah, that's tough. Like, would you say that's why you left the army then? Very much so. Yeah, yeah. I was very fortunate in that aspect of, I started journaling, um, like, near, near kind of near the end there. And through... And again, like this isn't all like this isn't didn't come around through me being like mm, I should start journaling. Let me just be all stoic and philosophical. Mm-hmm. It, it came a lot of it through I had great conversations with really great friends and good leaders all around me, and a lot of people who I was able to have these very in depth conversations with and air out some of these ideas. And through doing that, I eventually got into journaling, and through through these successive steps, eventually got to be a little more introspective. And that's mm-hmm. when I realized that I was getting pretty numb. And I was doing things out there and getting into the, in getting into combat and just sit, realizing that the only time I felt alive or could feel something was like in the gunfight, like in the action on a mission. And I was becoming very agitated, um, very aggressive, and almost becoming not a very good team member anymore, becoming more of a liability than an mm-hmm. asset. And and through this process, I was like, dude, I need to get out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I was very... I was very fortunate through my military experience. I got to do some different what we call programs um, and work with other other organizations. And I got to see guys who were 15, 20 years ahead of me down the road. And they were older dudes. And, we, you know, I remember looking up to these old guys like, oh, these old salty dogs kind of dudes. Because they're old, they're old war dogs. Yeah. And everybody wants to be like the old war dog. Um, and I realized that they were like, this is all they had. I mean, they may have had some other things and, you know, who knows. But this is what they did. All they did was go to war. And, like, I was like, dude, without this, like, what What are these? They're, like, you know, like heroin addicts. They're always chasing yeah. the dragon. And I was like, without this, like, they might not have much for life after. Um, and that, that kind of sparked the idea of, like, man, maybe I should get out, try and salvage this empathy and humanity that I still got left. And let's see if I can learn how to read and go to college. Yeah, that's awesome. And, yeah, I can only imagine, like, how tough it is, like, transitioning from being in the army to civilian life and just like curious like what happens after you leave like are you given like specific resources to help deal with things like PTSD or school or anything (laughs) yeah um so the military makes you do what's called ACAP um and I couldn't even tell you what that stands for Mm -hmm. but it's it's supposed to like kind of help you to off-ramp and you know not to not to bash the people that work there or anything like that but per standard almost everything that comes out of the federal government it's like meh it's 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 very okay um a band-aid and it's very yeah. much a band-aid yeah it's it's very much a band-aid and you know when coming out of the military it very much felt like i don't know if you've ever seen the movie talladega nights with ricky bobby but very much that scene where he's like what do i what do i do with my hands right like mm-hmm. i just i felt kind of lost and just like dude i i don't know what to do with my hands anymore um mm-hmm. and it, it felt very much having to find myself again and it it, it kicks off this next whole phase of my life where I'm trying to learn how to be me like who am I deep down again and as cheesy as that sounds it's when I'll go through experiences and be like do I like this because like Nick likes this or do I like this because this is what I was like kind of told and 
taught how to like things from the military. And it's, you know, like, to the idea of even crying, mm-hmm. um, I started crying again. And not just, like, like whimsical damsel in distress crying, <laughs> but, like, <laughs> like, I just started, like, I've been really working on my emotions mm-hmm. and, and trying to feel those little things out. Um, and I remember one of the first times I cried, cried, I was working an executive protection gig down in, um, down in Seattle and, you know, suit, gun, the whole like, mm, mm-hmm. supposed to be a hard ass kind of dude. And like, uh, we we're, we we're sitting down waiting, like I was waiting for the next thing to kick off and we we're, I was watching, uh, Avengers Endgame on my phone. And it was at the end when Captain America stays back in time to be with be with that the girl that he loves and they live their life together and all that jazz. Mm-hmm. And I remember just like busting down in tears. I was like, "Dude, he stayed back because he loved her." <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I was just sitting there crying. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I have to be like, "All right, all right, dude, get it, like, get it together, man. Like, you're supposed to be a hard ass. You're an executive protection agent right now." Yeah. Um, and you know, it's a lot of interesting transitory things like that where you got to kind of have to relearn who you are in, in mm-hmm. this new identity that's no longer. Um, an army ranger or or anything to do with the military you got to figure out who nick is again and Mm -hmm. that's always a whole ass thing yeah so like how did you find nick Ooh, um psychedelic drugs okay (laughs) (laughs) yeah um i was very i was very very fortunate that i got connected with some guys who were doing ayahuasca ceremonies for veterans and okay what it, what it looked yeah this, this is a whole thing um what it what it ended up looking like was i was in whistler snowboarding with some buddies uh on, on my way out of the army and we're sitting down at this table we just finished a fun day on the mountain drinks some beers and they're like dude you're getting out like what are you gonna do right when you get out what are you gonna do for your little your little leave here mm-hmm. and i was like uh, i think i'm gonna get a motorcycle in peru and ride it in chile and try to find someone to do ayahuasca with on the way there <laughs> my buddy was like <laughs> No, dude, that sounds terrible. That's a terrible idea. And I was like, what, dude? Like, I, like I'm like, i a capable human. I can just ride a motorcycle south. And he's mm-hmm. like, you dude, do not ride a motorcycle through the jungles looking for people to do drugs with. And I was like, oh. Like, when you say it like that, it sounds like a terrible idea, man. And he's like, look, dude, check it out. Um, I'm, I'm just like, I got invited to a veteran ayahuasca ceremony. Not my thing. But if you really want to do it, I can put in a word for you. And we can try that. And I was like, mm-hmm. right on, dude. That's, that's, that's better than aimlessly riding a bike to the jungles of Peru. Um, just a little know, bit. So, just a smidgen. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those, I'm a, I'm a full send kind of fella. I like to, if I'm going to do something, we're just going to jump in and do it. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately I have friends again who, who are kind of like the bumpers for me that are like, no, no, do not do that. Let's get you a little bit, a little bit safer here. Mm-hmm. And I ended up going through an ayahuasca ceremony with, an, with a group of veterans and that in, uh, say like, initially changed my life that yeah. allowed me to feel so many emotions and deal with a bunch of things that I've never dealt with before. It, it opened, I would say that sometimes you got to kick open the barrel, let the monkeys out mm-hmm. and it let all the monkeys out. And it was initially one of the most terrifying and like anxiety and fear ridden experiences I've ever had in my life. And <clears throat> so we finished the first, it's a two day ceremony. Yeah. We, we, we do the ayahuasca and it's just me freaking out pretty much for eight hours. Like I'm trying to, trying to purge. I'm trying to throw up. I'm going through the whole process. Yeah. I'm on my knees, I'm moaning. I'm like, Oh God, this is terrible. It feels like I have this giant wet blanket on me and it, it feels disgusting. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it finishes. And the next day, next morning we have a small group and the shaman's like, Hey man, um, like how you doing? And I was like, fucking bad, dude. That was terrible. Like, like, what the, like, these people are meeting Jesus and having talks with their ancestors. And I'm over here going to the pain cave. Like, what yeah. is going on? Um, and he was telling me, he's like, hey, man, you just got to so gotta let those emotions flow. Like, you've been bottling mm-hmm. up these emotions. And a lot of it was, like, fear and anxiety and all, and all these things. Because um, when you're doing the job, you don't have time to, to feel, like, it sounds super cheesy. And it's not meant to be, mm-hmm. like, a, a crappy 90s movie. But, like... You don't have time to feel that fear and that anxiety and like, oh no, what do we do? Like if you're, you know, we've, we've been in a few ambushes over there. And if you're in an ambush and you're just like, oh no, I'm in an ambush, what do I do? And you, you, you let that fear get a hold of you, you, you might die or you make it, might get your friends killed. And so then you have to just get up and start working. Um, so just years of stuff like that, I finally mm-hmm. come to the surface that night and in, it was wild. So 
we get ready for the second night of ceremony and shaman pulls me aside and he's like hey man how you doing i was like i'm terrified dude i am so scared right now he's like hey look dude it's your journey man like you don't have to go back in there if you don't want to and i was like look dude i told you i wanted i wanted to stare the devil in the eye like let's go meet the fucking devil and he's like yeah all right brother let's go um so we kick open that ceremony and where that fear and that anxiety and all that terror was got replaced with love and it it just like overwhelming amount of love Mm -hmm. and it's the most peaceful i've at that time one of the most peaceful and like filled and felt the most love i ever have in my life and that that immediately put me on a different path and i I call it the path of healing um and it it just changed my life in one of the most positive ways possible yeah that's awesome was that like the only time that you've used psychedelics oh no um (laughs) i feel like um, sometimes people think one and done and then they're done and it's not always the case yeah i mean it can be definitely right it's definitely the way the way I was somebody psychedelics to talk about psychedelics is that it's not for some people it might be one and done. Like you might mm-hmm. be like, dude, I got what I needed, I'm good, and you know you're on the path and away you go. Um, but you know, for me, I, I ended up utilizing ayahuasca, a handful of ceremonies, five meo, DMT, ibogaine, and psilocybin. Um, and what it averaged out to, where nowadays I maybe only do one psychedelic session a year, if that. Mm-hmm. And the way, the way I always try and describe psychedelics or what makes sense to me is if you think of your mind as a forest, you can get lost in a forest. You, you fall off the path and you might just be wandering around. And then you take a dose of psychedelics and you know, I, always, I always generally try and encourage people to do it within a controlled setting with, mm-hmm. and, and it sounds ridiculous to say, with a shaman because that could, that could just be like some white dude with dreadlocks or like it could just be like, <laughs> you know, it could be um, uh, like a certified shaman who's actually been trained, but try mm-hmm. and do it in a very ritualistic setting or with, with like a certified counselor. There's plenty of organizations out there that have these things. And when you take that psychedelic, it helps take you from that lost forge in your mind, it pulls you out and it shows you the path. And it's like, Hey man, if you want to get out of here, here's the path. Here's the trail to get out of this forest. And all you have to do is walk down that path. Um, but the, the thing that a lot of people are, or what I've noticed with the psychedelic community or with the popularity of psychedelics is they see that path, they get put on the path, and they don't actually do the work that it takes to keep walking that path. And it ends up being a lot of people talking about like, oh man, I need to go sit again. Oh man, I need to, I need another dose. And they, they, very may, they very may well need another dose, right? Mm-hmm. But the question is, did you do the work? Did you actually try walking down the path? Because when you when you get moved from the lost forest to the path, that's that beautiful experience, right? That's where everybody talks mm-hmm. about, it's like, oh, dude, you got all this crazy yeah. stuff, and it's it's an amazing experience, right? But some people, and there's a population or a demographic of the psychedelic community or, or those who practice it, really enjoy the feeling of getting shown the path, but mm-hmm. don't really actually want to do the work. And the work is hard, right? The work is the journaling, the meditating, the being very honest with yourself and being like, hey, man. Like, you're messed up. You need to deal with this. Like, it, mm-hmm. it, you know, all these different things that involve going down the path. And that's, I think, scarier and harder. So when, it, when you know, when the question comes, like, how often do you psychedelics? And for me personally, it always boils down, like, depends how often I get lost, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, if I, if I feel that I'm off the path and in the forest again, I'll utilize it again to level bubbles to get me back to where I feel like I should be going. And this year, it's only been one time. I did a very small dose of mushrooms. Um, and I was on a hike with some buddies in New Hampshire. It filled me with love. And I remember this point where we're all just sitting there on the edge, just, just staring over all these different mountains. And, and as far as yeah, I could see, it was this beautiful, beautiful fall, changing leaves. And we all just kind of sat there and cried for a little bit and just like had our moment. And we're just like, oh, this is beautiful. I love you guys, man. And it was a very beautiful moment. And that, that's what I needed. Yeah. On that moment, I came out of that and was like, all right, man, I'm back. Let's go. Time to hop on the horse, and we're, we're working again. Um, so so you, can, you can vary for, for different people. Yeah, how do you know when you're struggling and you need that like little bit of help to get back mm. on track? That's fair. Um, journaling. I, I, like, I, I mean, I keep my journal right here. It, it's, I think that's part of the work is you have to stay introspective, and you have to try and always check in with yourself and, and see where you're at. Mm-hmm. Um, because if, if not, like, you know, there's, there's like a old adage and I'm probably gonna mess this up. So bear with me. Mm -hmm. Um, but it it pretty much goes any port in a storm, right? 
if, if you don't know where you're going or where you're trying to go in the middle of a storm, you'll go anywhere. Yeah. And I think if you're not journaling and you're not paying attention to yourself and meditating and, and doing the things necessary, um, in, in that storm of life, you're just going to go anywhere. And then if you're just going anywhere, then you don't know where you're supposed to be. And therefore, like, you don't know if you should sit or not sit again or, or take the medicine or not take the medicine. And then you're just like, eh, I feel lost. Well, it's, you are lost, right? Because you don't know where you're going around yeah. a lot of other people. Yeah. And I saw your story the other day and you were talking about how you, like, meditated and you journaled and you did a cold <laughs> plunge. I hate cold plunges, by the way. Oh. I can't do them. <laughs> Um, what other work do you do to like work on yourself and to stay steady, I guess, in your journey? Um, that, that's, that's honestly like the day to day work is that that's what it is, right? It's, it's doing those hard things in the mornings, um, or at least for me personally, right? I, I like to, yeah. I like to stack my wins early in the morning. Um, but also like, you know, I've done Reiki energy healing. Um, I've done a lot of, uh, hypnotherapy it worked well for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, at this point in my life, I always call myself a hypocritical hippie, uh, in the idea, in the idea that, like I've you know I do psychedelics right like I'm very into spirituality I'm very much into like this idea of energy and the energy flows between things and the universe connects all these little thi- all these different things, um, but you like I'm hard pressed to see the signs in crystals and I'm like hard pressed <laughs> to see any proof in astrology right like yeah. so I'm I'm a very hypocritical hippie when it comes to these things but yet I'm very open minded. I was mm-hmm. I was very critical against sound baths the first time they ever did one. Yeah. I was in Mexico at an ibogaine ceremony, um, and this lady sits down. And she's like, "All right, check it out. We're gonna do sound bathing, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lull you guys into sleep, and then I'm gonna bring you guys back out with with these sound baths." And I was like, "Okay, like what do you know? Like mm-hmm. play your crystal bowls, and I'm gonna fall asleep." And like literally, she started going at it, and I passed out. And she's and she brought us back, and I woke up, and I was like, "Whoa, whoa! Like how did that happen, man?" Um, <laughs> So you know, I'm very, it, I can I can get swayed either way, um, but I, but again, like a lot of that, a lot of the extra things I'll do, it, it it comes from the daily work and checking in and just trying to be intuitive to myself of like, hey, is my energy off or am I not drinking water? Like like yeah. you know, it could really it could really feel those things. You're like, hey, it, it, why am I off my game? Why are things not working for me? It's like, oh well, I haven't been sleeping well. I haven't I've been eating a ton of crap food. I haven't mm-hmm. working out. I haven't been drinking water. And then it's like, okay, let me try this for a week. Let me, let me like really focus on these things and see how I do. And generally, you know, the, the blade gets honed again. I, all my things get realigned and I'm able to be like, okay, this is what's going on. I, I didn't need to sit with psychedelics again or I didn't need to go to Reiki Healer. Mm-hmm. Ends up I needed to drink water and stop eating shit. Yeah. I feel like it's like the little things that impact your life, like sleep and everything else. Like I know for me, like I need my sleep. Oh. Also I'm like cranky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I remember I, um, I when I got back from Ranger School, I went to Ranger School when I was young, 2012. Uh, I think I was like 19 or 20 years old. And growing up, my dad was always like, hey, like you need, he prioritized sleep very heavily in my household. Mm-hmm. He was like, you need eight hours of sleep, you need eight hours of sleep, you need eight hours of sleep. I came back from Ranger School and I was like, check it out, Dad. I just did the Army's hardest leadership school on less than five hours of sleep a night. Wow. And then I, I, like, I prided myself on that. And then mm-hmm. I didn't, but then I also was like falling apart all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, where nowadays it's like, dude, if I don't get seven and a half hours of sleep or more, like I'll, I'll pretty much right off that day. I'm like, ah, we're, we're good. I, this is not my priority is I need to get that sleep. Yeah. I'm the same way. Um, okay. So you get the treatment and then you decide to go back to school, let alone like yep. Harvard. So like what inspired, you know, going back to school and what inspired Harvard? Oh man. Um, <laughs> this sounds, yeah. So going back to school, I always wanted to, um, like I, it's funny when I when I was getting ready to get out of high school and, and playing with the idea of military I initially wanted to go to what's called FITM the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in LA or I wanted to go to culinary school okay. um, and I was like if I go to college we're going to do this thing and I was very much into, I very much like to read GQ and things like that back mm-hmm. then um, and that all, the idea of getting an education almost kind of was in the back of my head even through the military and things like that so when I realized I was getting out and I started to build a plan, I was like, all right, like, I don't think I'm going to go to Fashion Institute Design and Merchandising anymore. We're going to do something, we're gonna do something a little different. And, you know, a lot of people do it and good on them, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I'm also not going to go to culinary school. Like, what can I do 
that I, that I feel can actually make a large impact. The idea of selfless service, right? Um, that's one of the things that helped me get into the military and what I really enjoyed about the military was we were all working to this accumulative goal of, of, of ultimately what I thought was to help others. Um, and it, it really involved us going all in it and doing this, doing this thing. So I looked at college and I'm like, what can I study in college that I truly feel I can throw myself into, go all the way in this idea of selfless service? And initially I was thinking maybe I'll be a marine biologist because I like to surf, I like being outside, I've always lived somewhere cold still, this would be cool. But as I kind of thought about it and really needed to like, I quote unquote, meditated on it, um, I knew that it was more of a self-serving goal and the byproduct of being a marine biologist potentially that I could help other people, but that wasn't the intent of it. So then I went down to Texas, uh, saw one of my old friends down there, and we did a mushroom ceremony. We did what's called a heroic dose, about five grams, and we do our ceremony, and in the ceremony, one of the intents that I set for it was like, I wanna focus on the idea of like, what can I do in college? What can I study that will actually help other people in, in something that I believe in? And I'm, I'm going through it in this mushroom trip, da 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 and I come out of it, and I'm like, brain shit. I wanna study brain shit. And like that's how educated I was at the time. I didn't even know neuroscience was a word. I was just like mm -hmm. brain shit. So I I, <laughs> I googled um, what is the study of the human brain, and neuroscience popped up, and I was like, rad. All right, let's figure this out. And I just kind of searched around, and did my googling, figured out that not only is neuroscience a field of study, but within the field of neuroscience, uh, it's psychedelics have been kind of like an emerging hot topic and obviously now it's kind of everywhere mm -hmm. so it's like all right well this is the direction i want to go and then it came applying to schools um and this is where it gets kind of ridiculous uh because my my grandfather went to usc okay. and in my house so when i remember when i was applying to colleges and starting to look at these things i was talking to an academic counselor and she was like hey like you have a really good resume dude like you could probably get into an ivy league school and I was like, I don't know what that is. And she's like, these are really good schools. Think about it as like the special operations of education. I was like, oh, dope. Like, I'm special operations. I should probably try and go to special operations of education. Mm -hmm. um, and then so she gave me a list of Ivy League schools. And I pretty much looked at these eight schools and was like, all right, of these places, where can I surf, where can I snowboard, and where can I get the most time outdoors? And what it narrowed down to was Boston. And I was like, all right, dope. What's in Boston? Um, and it ended up being Harvard and I was like, all right, cool, dude, we're going to full send this. And I got very fortunate and here we are. Um, it's a very non-conventional Harvard story, but you know, it's, it, it ended up being like, I'm very, very grateful to be here. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I very much like the idea that I, I try and always pursue things that make me happy, that bring joy into my life. And for me, it's being outside, surfing, snowboarding, skating, fishing, things that allow me to be grounded and like stay true to like, stay true to who I am. And yeah. it just worked out well that I, that I got here. Like I got, I went surfing yesterday. And I went surfing yesterday and Friday, right? So it's like, I get to kind of do all the things I love and, and, and have this like childlike happiness all the time. That's awesome. So like, what like has the experience been like actually going to school though? It's, I feel like the school been, part is hard. <laughs> the school part is so hard, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah. I always make the jokes. I wish someone told me college is hard. Uh, I, I very much remember being in the military, especially my younger years, the 18 to 22 time frame, and very much judging kids on, kids who I, who I knew at that time were also in college. You know, my first deployment I did very young, and it was very hard. It was just mm -hmm. straight up hard living. We're out in like hand washing. I remember... We had an ice bucket um, that you had to like break up with a knife and like break up the ice when when it wasn't frozen. And then you had a, a bar of soap and your socks. And you, we we had handmade washing boards, and we we're trying to like lather soap in frozen water with our socks. Whoa. And like, all right, well, that's about as clean as it gets, dude. But we also didn't really have heat, right? So you just kind of like hung it in one of the tents, and we're just like, hopefully it kind of thaw frozen icy dirty sock with like clumps of soap in it, and you're just like all right, that's cool, man, let me go do guard. And then we're getting attacked, we're going on missions, all these things. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing these Facebook posts back then, or even some of my space, because, you know, that's how old I am. And they, like, people were commenting about how hard school was. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, like, I don't know, man, like, I'm getting shot at. Like, people are actively trying to kill me out here. Like, yeah. school's not that hard. And I always had this very negative bias towards school. And when I left the military, I was like, hey, like, 
out of out of successful special operations career, I just explained to Afghanistan, like been through the ringer. Um, like how hard can college be, dude? Surprise, it's hard. <laughs> it's yeah. very hard. <laughs> like I did not give it its due credit, and I very much underestimated how bad this could be. Um, but with that being said, like again, I'm I'm very fortunate that like with the people that I met here, the other veterans and, and these undergraduates, these 19 to 22 year old kids have been very welcoming. And they've like, if it wasn't for them, like mainly my peers, uh, I would have probably flunked out, stressed out and just had a very negative attitudes towards school. Um, yeah. I live in the dorms. Like this is, this is my dorm room that we're in right now. And I get off, I often, I get asked like what, what it's like living in the dorms. I don't have any roommates. So that, that makes life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but it, it's amazing because I get to, sit and talk and like hear these thoughts of kids that like I would never have interacted with in, in my everyday life I would never cross these kids on the street and obviously for them to get to a school like this at, at their age at, mm -hmm. at, at like late teens early 20s they're incredibly insightful a lot of the conversations we have like I wouldn't be able to have these with dudes I used to work with we're able to de like debate very nuanced topics and, and cover a wide breadth of of subjects like in an insane, insane level of detail. And it always blows my mind. Um, yeah. I find that I often get detracted from the things that I'm doing because we end up having these wild conversations, um, exploring just different ideas and flipping, like flipping the per proverbial stones over and be like, hey, what is this? Why, why don't we look into this? How do we go about that? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, college in itself has been very difficult and stressful and hard, but just like almost anything else I've done in life, I've been very fortunate that I've had very good people around me to kind of help me through this and kind of kind of show me the way and ends up this time it's 19 year old kids <laughs> yeah and i think in one of your posts on instagram you wrote um life experience is context driven i thought because people haven't been to war they don't know what hardship is or that they don't know struggle i've met so many resilient people here and have been through things as teenagers that i don't think i'd be able to bounce back from now and i thought that was kind of crazy just seeing it um you know seeing your perspective um, I think a lot of times like people discount their trauma because they don't feel like they've been at war or have killed someone or anything is following. And I feel even for myself, it's something I question often. It's like, what's trauma? So like, what would you define trauma as? Oh man, I, I don't <laughs> have a very good answer for that, to be honest. Um, but to it, to it though, I very much think that like trauma's trauma. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. And the hardest thing you've done is the hardest thing you've done. And it can't yeah. be compared to the hardest thing I've done. Right. So like, you know, if th there's billionaires here, right, there's billionaire kids here. And if no, no shade to them, nothing, whatever, like you have a different life than I do. And the hardest thing they've ever done was not get the BMW they wanted for Christmas. Where, like, I don't even know if that's real, right? I'm just making this up. Yeah. But if the hardest thing in their life is like they got the wrong color BMW, well, mm -hmm. then that's like the hardest thing in their life. Right. Where I have another friend here. She was homeless. She was in and out of halfway houses, in and out. Her mom was in and out of rehab things like that and while she was homeless in high school she had to like take care of her little brother her little sister like when her mom would go off and, and do these these things in rehab or what have you they were on the streets or they were like bouncing around the system and she had to take care of them while going to high school while making sure that everything was taken care of and was still able to get in harvard right so mm -hmm. like the hardest thing she's ever had to do is very different from the hardest thing somebody else has had to do but you but trauma is a one-to-one -one ratio right and it, it's one of those things that you're just like holy cow, I, you know, I, I wasn't rich by any means. I was on the upside of poor and the low side of middle class. Um, but I never had to deal with anything like that. I never had the pressure yeah. of my parents aren't there. Who knows where my next, next meal is coming from. And now my siblings depend on me and I have to work hard enough academically to get into college, right? That's a lot of pressure for a very young person to go through. And when I, when I hear these stories, I'm like, God dang, dude. Yeah. Like, I don't, like, I've never had to deal with anything that stressful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like it probably helps to have like that support of like family as well for you. I feel like for a lot of people, they don't have that support of family, and it's like it makes such a difference. I feel like in life. Absolutely. Um, I remember even like reading a study about veterans with like a supportive family and ones without, and the ones without like were more likely to struggle with PTSD. And it's like, oh my god, like that's crazy. Yeah, no, that's that. I I couldn't imagine how hard that would be coming back from like an intense combat experience, even if it wasn't intense, right? Mm -hmm. Just coming back from, again, whatever your traumatic experience was from the military side and not having a support system and not having people there who looked out for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was very fortunate, like, with my parents, 
we had a little bit of a rocky relationship when I left. Um, but even coming back, they were always very supportive, and they got to see me through my phases, and they pretty much just saw me get more jaded and more numb and just yeah. quote unquote harden. Um, and even through all that, they supported me. Right, I'd, I'd come back and I'd tell them what what it. I wouldn't get into all the details, but I'd pretty much give them like the skinny on what happened on deployments. And it was a lot of like surprise, we killed people. Like I watched yeah. a dude die. You know, I I shot this guy. I did I did whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for them, they were very much like, "Holy shit, this isn't this isn't our eighteen year old surfer bum kid anymore." Uh, mm-hmm. And they didn't really know what to do about it. But they were still very supportive, and they were very always there for me. And I'm very positive that if I didn't have them to help me through these times and kind of be that that rock for me, um, whether I knew it or not, I'd very I'd, I'd more than likely have a very much different outcome on the trajectory of my life to where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, like, what would you recommend for someone that is carrying trauma and doesn't have that support? Oh, man. Um, reach out. <laughs> reach yeah. out. Like, it's, I think, and I can only speak to, you know, obviously, like, dudes and dudes who kind of been through what I've been through or very similar, very mm-hmm. similar experiences um, within the team settings and things like that. But reach out to your boys. Like, one thing I think a lot of guys struggle with is they don't want to be a burden, and especially when the guys are still active, right? Like, yeah. I still have friends who are very much operational, and I would very, I would feel like a burden. Even now, like, knowing what I know and, and you know, being hypocritical to what I'm saying, like, I would still feel like a burden if I called them and it was like, hey, dude, rough day at classes. And there's like, mm-hmm. hey, bro, like, we have the war to fight still, right? But, I mean, at the same time, that's what it'd feel like. But in reality, they'd pick up that phone and they'd put everything aside and they'd want to talk to me, right? Because the idea is, like, they would pick up the call and they'd talk to me or, like, the, who knows what could happen in the negative context of what could happen if you don't pick up the call. And, and that being said, like, I don't always have the chance to pick up the call. But to the people who who don't have that familial support is I would reach out to the boys, always call back. And, like, also if you're a burden, like, screw it, dude. Like, be a burden. Be a burden because they do love you. They do care about you. And, like, the boys want you to be here. And the last thing they want to do, the last thing any of us want to do is go to another funeral, hear taps get played, and have to sit there and be like, damn, dude, I wish you called me. You know? And yeah. it's, make the call. Reach out to the boys. Oh, we make the joke is always kiss the homies goodnight. Like, like reach out to the homies and let them know, like, hey, man, I need help. Um, because they're always going to be there for you. Yeah, and if somebody came to you asking for help, what, how would you help them? Oh, man. That, like... That, that's case dependent. That's uh, it depends on who it is, but generally it's like, hey man, what's going on? Like talk to me, just like just talk to me. I was I remember one year I was studying for final. And he, like what what do you need? And he's just like, dude, every time I see my kids, I see these kids' faces. And I was like, what what kids? He's like, I, I actually like or like not actually but like we killed these kids in Afghanistan mm-hmm. when, on one deployment. And he's like, dude, every time I see my kids, I see their faces. And he's like, what do I do about this? And I was just like, holy crap, yeah. dude! Like I'm, you know I'm sitting in a library like. But then, you know, I gave him my attention. So I'm not like, hey, buddy, like, I, I was like, dude, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do, bro. I don't have kids. I've been very fortunate. I never had to put any kids down. Um, but I was like, dude, I love you, bro. Like, I'm here for you. I love you. Like, hey, you're driving home right now. Let's just talk. Just talk, dude. Just yeah. just let it out, bro. It's okay. Um, so I'd say it's like, you know, what the homies call you or somebody calls you, you don't know what to do. Just, just try and be there for them, right? Sometimes, especially for a lot of men, it's just pent up, or like, just held up emotions that they don't know what to deal with and you know if you can't name it you can't tame it and a lot of these emotions we can't name or, or, or put a label to and it just explodes and they don't know what to do about it so like a lot of it's just like hey man I don't I don't have an answer but like let it out bro like I'm a safe space dude I love you just let me have it like we, we'll get through this and a lot of times it's just dudes venting and they just need to get these thoughts and these ideas that are chewing them up and like like a lot of like guys are like dude I don't know what to do it's like I don't either bro but we're going to figure it out, and we're going to be here, and you're not going to shoot yourself tonight. How about that? You're like, mm-hmm. all right, cool. I'm not going to shoot myself tonight. I'm like, all right, right on, dude. All right, well, well, I'll text. shoot me a text tomorrow. Let me know you didn't die, <laughs> right? And yeah. it's just like, as more as it sounds, like, especially within the military or the infantry and the special operations capacity, it, it is like that. It's like, hey, dude, don't kill yourself, all right? All right, no, like, seriously, don't. Text me in the morning. I want to know you're not dead. Like, all right, cool, man. I'll, t- I'll shoot you text in the morning. And, that, and that's often a lot of times all a dude needs to hear. Yeah, I feel like a lot of it is listening and just being there. But I would also say that you, that kind of person would also need some kind of therapy or help or some kind oh, of professional yeah. yeah, advice as well. <laughs> it's about doing the work, like you said. Um, Absolutely. So 
So what non-standard therapy would you like recommend for people oh, that man. are struggling? Oh, that, that's a, that's a case dependent thing. One of my favorites yeah. is I like cold showers and cold plunges. Um, I very much, I'm actually the mug right behind me, this group called non-standard, uh, they're a nonprofit. You can find them on standard.org and their whole thing is connecting dudes with cold plunges and as, as like Jim bro and like Joe Rogan is that sounds, um, I think one of the beauty of cold plunges is just the adversity of it all. And, and mm-hmm. that's what I think the beauty of the non-standard part of that is, is like I, I myself, I take a cold shower every day. I've been doing it for over, over a year now. And every day I still stand naked in front of my shower. I'm like, mm, I don't necessarily want to do this right now, right? Yeah. But you do it. And, and where I think the benefit of that is, is for these guys or for these people who are who are going through the struggle and all they need to do is take a win. They need a small win for that day to do something hard. Whatever it is, 30 seconds in a cold shower can, can kickstart that process. And there's, there's a cascading events or cascading um, effects, uh, positive effects. But just the initial mental of like, hey, I'm going to do something hard. It's not going to kill me. And we're going to get this day started. And it, it just starts with a very small 30-second victory. Um, I, I think that's one of my favorites. And after that, it's always get outside, get with a group, and move. And if you can't with, get with a group, get outside and move. Go for a walk, go for a run, do something, get fresh air, get some blood flowing. Um, you know, I find that within my own life and within a lot of my buddies' lives, just those two things can really change your day around and mm-hmm. really change that narrative, that negative narrative kind of bounce around dudes' heads. Yeah, would you recommend like any psychedelics more than others as well? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I personally generally stay within the organic, quote unquote organic, <laughs> like, like non-GMO psychedelics. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I generally stay within like the quote unquote natural psychedelics like ayahuasca, DMT, and mushrooms. But with, with that being said, um, I, I, I'm always slightly hesitant to recommend people to try psychedelics because it's not a cure all by any yeah. means, right? It, it's very much a tool to can help you, just like journaling and meditation are tools. Psychedelics are also tools, um, and I, I always always tell dudes who are interested like, this is a lifelong journey. You mm-hmm. you don't just do psychedelics and like punch the button and be like, all right, like if yeah. you do this, it will put it will expose you to different spiritualities, different things. And kind of show you something else, and you're you're gonna be different for for if not forever for a very long time, and it'll change a lot of how you look at the world. Um, and I think it's a very important thing to do, and I, I think it's very very powerful for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But also, you know, with the part of advocacy, I believe become comes with education. And like, if people are have high blood pressure, if they have familial history of schizophrenia or mental illnesses. Um, like you shouldn't even smoke weed, dude. Like, yeah. like you should, you should avoid all kind of psychoactive substances or any potential mind altering substances. Um, so I, I think it's a very helpful and can be a very beneficial tool of a non standard therapy for a lot of people. I mean, that's that's what I'm doing here in college, right? Like, yeah. I'm I'm studying neuroscience so that I can advocate better for psychedelics and and advocate for psychedelic therapy. Um, but with that being said, I think it can potentially be dangerous for some people. Mm-hmm. And if anybody's interested in it, like, go do the research. Go talk to people. I mean, like John Hopkins has put out a ton of research, and, and there's a lot of resources out there. Um, and I cannot stress for a lot of people, like, if this is something you're interested in, like, go do some research, reach out to somebody, and, and like, ensure that you're going about it in a very safe and controlled manner. Yeah, I feel like a lot of times people want, like, quick fixes. Like, they just want the pain oh. to stop. And I feel like even, like, with my struggle with, eat, like, having an eating disorder, it's like I just wanted it done, and I wanted a magical, like, solution, and that's not the way that life works. You know, it's always <laughs> putting in the work and doing work every single day, like you were saying. Yeah. Do you, so, I mean, do you feel that uh, psychedelics would have helped you with your eating disorder back then? I have no idea. I love hearing about it because it's... Yeah. Um, but maybe, who knows? Yeah, who knows, right? I, I find this that whole thing just, it, it's, it's one of those, again, it's, it's such a new tool. I'm mm-hmm. always curious on like, you know, I, I don't claim to be a subject matter expert by any means, uh, but I'm always just curious to see like how it can be utilized to help different things. I, my experience and my relationship with it has only been within the quote unquote PTSD and trauma space, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or my very small niche of trauma. Um, but I find it interesting to see, like, I wonder, like, who knows if that, if that would have helped or could help uh, people with eating disorders or, or not, you know, like, it's just, I find the whole thing interesting, I guess. Yeah, I feel like for me, like, eating, like, foods, like, with probiotics and, like, foods that were, like, healthy and nourishing, like, I definitely noticed, like, a difference in just, like, my brain and my mental space and 
just everything else. And I think that's kind of interesting just based on the studies that they've been doing with like gut health and how that impacts. So absolutely. That's another thing, like with the non-standard forms of therapy and and it's, it's unfortunately one of such a broad sweeping term, you'd be like, that's non-standard and that's non-standard. Yeah. But for a lot of people who are struggling, like the idea of eating healthy, like changing your diet up can literally like it worked phenomenons for people's lives. Mm -hmm. Right. And she's actually talking about gut health and probiotics. Like, if, if dudes are smacking down Mickey D's every day and they're like, oh man, I started journaling, yeah. but I feel like shit still. It's like, I don't know, man. Try not to eat fried foods for a few days and see what happens. Um, and they can slowly change change that change that tide for a lot of people and help improve their lives drastically. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so speaking of mental health, you are attempting <laughs> to be the first actively enrolled student in the history of Harvard to summit the tallest mountain on every continent to bring attention to student mental health and encourage veterans to pursue education after their military service. So why summoning and not running or anything else? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so funny, like I think most things in my life, like you know, I, I joke about this because like today I made an Instagram post about like planning and focusing on goals and things like that. Um, but a lot of things in my life kind of just come out of, come out of nowhere and are, mm-hmm. aren't very heavily planned. And how this kind of all came into uh, fruition is I was with one of my buddies um, here at school, former Air Force Special Operations guy, and we were like, dude, we need something to do over Christmas break. And he's like, what are you thinking? I was like, want to walk up Kilimanjaro? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So we started planning that. And as we started planning that and trying to like figure out how we want to do it, he, it was, he was like, hey man, this could probably be something big. Like we could honestly probably draw a lot of attention to this and try and focus this to something positive, something we care about. And that, that's mm-hmm. how we that's how we settled on like student mental health, encouraging veterans to pursue education and things like that. And we're like, okay, but like what after that? Because Kilimanjaro is a one-off thing. And he's like, why don't we do the seven summits? And I was like, bro, like <laughs> what is that? I was like, what is that? And I'm in. Like that just sounds awesome, so I'm in. But what is it? And he was like, it's the tallest mountain every continent. And I was like, that sounds amazing. Let, let's let's try and do this thing. Let's try and point all this energy and try and do something positive with this. Unfortunately, due to a skydiving accident uh, when he was in the military, while we are training for Kilimanjaro, he ended up hurting his knee. And it was either get knee surgery or stop climbing. Um, so I ended up kind of doing it, doing the seven summits on my own. Um, but that, that's kind of how the, it initially began. And the idea was, like, why mountain climbing was literally climbing like the 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 literal metaphor literal and metaphorical of climbing a mountain and the idea was here at school we have um our health services and it it was a three to seven three to seven month wait um to go see a therapist or healthcare professional if like through signing for the school and we thought that was kind of ridiculous because when you hit the oh shit button of like i need to see a healthcare professional i need Mm -hmm. mental health help you don't do it in three to seven months of like Mm, finals around the corner like I might need a therapist then or like mm, I don't know maybe something something tragic is going to happen in my life let me just plan it out right it's like mm-hmm. oh my god now like I need it now um, and we wanted to we got wrapped around the idea of massive action inspire small action and within his life and my life where we found a lot of help and a lot of solace in, in like therapeutic gains we're doing hard things with friends in nature mm-hmm. um, and with us you know being Harvard being Harvard students and all this, I we, we we figured if like if we can make the time to train, to climb these mountains, to fundraise, to do all of these things, then hopefully we can inspire someone, if they're going through a hard mental health problem, to get with a few friends and go on a walk. It's like, hey, if I can do all of this, if I can summit the tallest mountain on every continent and again this isn't just like it is for fun, but it's also for my own mental health. Like I, I gain something out of this personally as well. And so if I can do this for my own mental health then like you should be able to get with some friends or not or just go Mm -hmm. on your own go for a run go outside get some movement do something um and we really want to encourage the idea and and obviously there's science behind it that like movement outside helps uh depression anxiety and Mm -hmm. i think that's a big problem here here at school and not only just within harvard but within college students nationwide Mm -hmm. um and we really want to focus on encouraging veterans to pursue education after military service and the idea behind that isn't a four-year college like you have to go to harvard you have to go to an ivy league it's any kind of education just do something and when you transition out of the military for a lot of people it can either be a springboard that sends you off in a great trajectory 
or it can knock you to your knees. And for a lot of people, they get knocked to their knees during the transition and they never fully have the ability to stand back up because life just comes at them sideways on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, but if you get into any kind of education, right, whether it be a trade school for like welding, I mean, a four year, go get a pilot's license, go become any, like literally anything that the GI Bill covers, it gives you a bit of a period, a grace period. And in that grace period, it allows you to kind of like transition, find yourself again. It gives you a, a, a time to kind of wander and find your, and like figure out who you are, what you like to do while still getting a paycheck, while still getting like all the benefits that, that are needed for this time. And it, it gives you time to breathe. I think that's very important for a lot of people, as well as it gives you exposure. Mm -hmm. um, you, just through coming to college, I've got to sit and talk with so many amazing people, again, that I said before, that have never crossed my path. One of my best buds here is a former professional ballet dancer. And I don't know if, yeah, right? Like, whoa, dude, whoa, like a world, world-class ballet dancer. And it's like, I don't know if people know this, but former Army Rangers and former ballet dancers generally don't tend to run in the same circles. Uh, no? Kinda, yeah, it's wild, right? Wild. Um, and through him being one of my buds, like, I've got to have these insane conversations and explore my own biases and then really really gain insight on how I think, right? Because he challenges almost everything I say, not this like, mm -hmm. Nick, you're a dick, like I need, you, you need somebody to stand up to you kind of challenge, but he's like, you know, we'll have a conversation, he's like, why do you think that? Like, what, what in your life has led you to this decision? And I'll be like, dude, actually, I don't know. <laughs> and then like, we'll, we'll unpack these things, right? And we're able to have this safe, sp safe space to exchange ideas where we both know that like, we, we both think highly of each other. We both know that we are, we are men of good character. So if we disagree and we come to these points in conversations where we, we may like really truly disagree fundamentally what we're saying, it's still out of respect and it's still out of place of growth. And I wouldn't have gotten that if I didn't get the exposure of coming and, and pursuing education, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of those really things that I, wanna, I really wanna drive home to a lot of vets and a lot of people transitioning out of the military. It's like, hey, pursue education. It's gonna be a net positive. It's gonna allow you to be, get a new train of thought, fresh ideas, fresh people, and help you grow all within a safe space. Yeah, I love why you're doing it. I love why you're summiting. It's so important. And I can only imagine that you faced so many challenges and had so many self-doubts while doing it. Um, so how do you like push through it and say, screw yeah. it, I'm doing it. Yeah, dude, the self-doubts, man, that, that's, that's, I feel a lot of those, right? Um, yeah. It, it's, it's, they're kind of always there. Um, Accountability, like I, I think I always will go back to having good people around me and having people around me that, you know, I can be accountable to. And I know that even if I fail, will still love me. Um, mm -hmm. But because I know these people love me and, and have these high things of accountability, um, it allows me to push on. It allows me to push through these things. Um, and it, it allows me to like, like, for example, I try to run across Puerto Rico. Uh, over spring break one year. I was like, dude, let's do something rad. Like, I'm gonna just try and run across the island of Puerto Rico. It's 133 miles east to west. I only made it 50 <laughs> miles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plot twist, I didn't make it. It was only 50 miles. Um, but, you know, tons of self-doubt, right? I was like, dude, I don't know if I can do this. Like, we're, we're gonna find out, right? Like, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna send it live and see what happens. Um, and I, I wouldn't have even gotten 50 miles if it wasn't for a couple of buddies that came with me to the island and act as my support crew. And they, they helped me through these moments of self-doubt. Like they saw me struggling, they saw me going through these moments and like they, they were there for me. And you know, for these moments of, of these mountain climbs or these endurance events or being here at school, um, it's riddled with self-doubt. It, it's pretty much a daily thing, right? Mm -hmm. I talk about daily affirmations a lot and that's how I help get through the self-doubt. But also having people around me that I know I can talk to and express these doubts to and be like, hey man, uh, there's there's a buddy here at the school. He's a former Marine Special Operations guy. I remember one day I was, I was just going through it studying, and I was like, "Dude, am I a bitch?" <laughs> he just looks at me. He's like, "What, dude?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, man." Like I was like, "I'd rather be in the field doing anything else, anything else, than trying to learn like, what a derivative is right now." And I was like, mm -hmm. "I like I, I'm I'm too stupid, dude." I was like, "I'm dumb. I, I think like I'm maybe a coward. Like I, I don't want to be here anymore." And he's just like, "Look, dude." We all go through it, bro. It's part of the struggle. <laughs> like, it's okay to be scared. And I was just like, are you sure, man? Because, like, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but I used to be a ranger. And I used to fight people for a living. And I was like, I don't get scared kind of thing. And he's just like, dude, it's it's okay, buddy. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to be like, you're not stupid. Yeah. And he's like, you got this, bro. 
right? So it's just having these people and, and trying to create these environments where it's okay to feel these emotions, but yet still get through them and voice, your, and voice my fears. Yeah. I feel like sometimes we think we're like the only ones dealing with like self-doubt or like <laughs> yeah. thinking we're the oddity. We can't do this. And it's yeah. not the case at all. And I think that's yeah. such an important reminder. So I have two Absolutely. more questions if you have time. Hit me. Okay. Right, let's go. So just bringing this whole podcast together with this question, but if you could go back 20 years ago, like would there be anything you would do different? No, no, there's not. And the reason I say that is every decision I've made, good or bad, has brought me like to here, to like this exact spot, sitting in this chair having this conversation with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very much enjoying this. And, and I, I think this is an awesome experience, right? So to say that I regret any decision that happened in the last 20 years, would say that I regret where I ended up mm -hmm. because of these decisions, good or bad, brought me here. So I, I try and keep the perspective that like, whether or not I like every decision I've ever made, I don't regret them because then I wouldn't be the person who I am. And I wouldn't be in the position that, I, that I'm in right now. So yeah. we just kind of keep sending it live. I love that. Um, would there be any advice that you would give yourself? Yeah, don't be a dick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, I, would, I would probably say empathy. Um, focus on empathy and focus on like, <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's actually the, just to like, the first thing would be empathy and be like, hey man, like, like really try and, and try and take the time to try and understand how others feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm laughing because the second thing would be like, train core. Um, like train your core really hard because <laughs> like like I, I, I have back pain right like one of the things like the military gave me was also uh, lower back arthritis and chronic lower back pain mm. um, and I think a lot of that could have been avoided if instead of just trying to be like the biggest strongest guy which I'm like 5'8 and 190 pounds so I'm not mm. exactly the biggest or the strongest guy right but I was very much like I need to be super jacked and all these things back then if I had trained my core a little bit better and spent time like developing a stronger core, I'd probably have less back pain. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd feel a lot stronger foundationally. And I, I'm dealing with that currently. Like, I'm 31 and I'm still having to deal with deficiencies that are in my life <laughs> because I didn't train core. So I guess <laughs> if I could tell myself something 20 years ago, it's like, hey man, be more empathetic. Like take the time to realize other people have emotions and that other people may be having a bad day too. So like try and, try and understand that and meet them at that level. And then train core because lower back pain sucks. <laughs> Both are very different, but I love it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so where can everyone go to find you? Um, right now, I'm on Instagram at the underscore flying Hawaiian. And I just made a TikTok as well at the underscore flying Hawaiian. Um, awesome. There's not much on TikTok, so bear with me. Um, but the Instagram is kind of where I, I live and put out the most content. Love it. Okay, so I just wanted to end the podcast with a post you've shared about summiting. You said, summiting okay. Mount Denali was the first time I've cried from a physical accomplishment in my life. The crying that moment made it that much more special and full of love. And I just wanted to share because I think it's important. Like you went from, you know, using psychedelics as like your last hope. I know you said that in your podcast um, to climbing the summit with all the feels. And I feel like it shows that no matter what you're going through, life can and does get better. And it's an incredible feeling when you go from being numb to feeling everything and something to really live for. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It was, yeah, I was up there. I remember I cried. I, I gave my tentmate Steve a hug. I was like, dude, we did it. Cried. And then like, as we're crying, our, our tears froze to our face. And I was just like, all right, <laughs> enough of this. Like, I can't, I can't open my eyes. This hurts too much. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful moment. I love you. But, dude, I can't open my eyes. They're frozen. <laughs> yeah. So I loved having you on this podcast. I love this conversation. And just for anybody that's listening, be sure to follow Nick, subscribe to this podcast, and leave a review. Until next time.